Hello, uh, in this video we're going to look at a new architecture design for MMO type games and what I've done is I've created a small MVP to sort of demonstrate its capability. So we're going to be synchronizing motion with Unreal Engine client and a Micronaut server. So the Unreal Engine client can actually be other um, game engines as well, for example Unity, and the custom server doesn't have to be built using Java Micronaut, it could be, you know, for example, .NET for instance. So we're actually looking at the uh, general architecture design rather than the implementation details. Uh, in this video and uh, some of the implementation details are actually covered in uh, these subsequent posts as well so I'll look to create some videos covering them as well. So this particular video will focus on the why and how I suppose. So uh, perhaps we'll get started with the why first. So for instance with Unreal Engine you currently have a native network replication. So what that means is basically if you have the simple scenario of a monster and several clients that want to be synchronized with each other, uh, what you'll actually have is this Unreal Engine dedicated server, so UE server, and it's basically handling everything for you, right? So this mob will be controlled by the UE server. These clients are communicating with the UE server and the UE server actually replicates uh, this player inside itself. And what it'll actually do is then pass that information back to other clients, right? So uh, for instance, in uh, this current scenario, uh, the UE uh, creates and controls this mob um, and that exists inside the Unreal Engine server. Uh, this client walks around and every time it does so, it's updating the parameters in the UE server. And it's the UE server simultaneously passes back information about everything else in its vicinity, right? So it's basically doing everything. Um, and that's kind of uh, the problem, right? Because uh, this is essentially a monolith design where the UE server is trying to do everything. And that's where the limitation comes from. Uh, and to be honest, it's quite surprising that it's even able to account for 100 players in a map because that's quite a lot of data that it needs to handle and process. And, you know, it's doing that really well. Uh, but having said that, you know, the equipment, the hardware that you'll need to support that is going to be quite expensive because, I mean, that's not a small feat, right, that it's achieving there. So uh, it's definitely doing a lot of stuff. So um, this is where this new architecture will come in. It's like, how do you distribute that load? How can you split that work so that you can actually support more clients and uh, potentially, you know, more mobs um, in a particular instance so that, you know, you can have more than 100 players in a particular zone and they can all interact with each other. So uh, the main thing that you'll need to do is basically remove the monolithic component from your design and look to distribute that load. So that, that's what we're trying to achieve here. Okay, so now let's look at the how. So um, I've referenced a, a little post inside here, which is uh, uh, a post from Confluent, and it's about how to design real-time gaming infrastructure for millions of users. So it's using Kafka to achieve this. So inside this post, you basically have this diagram, and this is uh, essentially how uh, we can distribute that load, how we can support more players, uh, in a map and uh, basically cater for them. So what we'll have is essentially these players which are connected to web sockets. So th they will run on a particular server instance and that server instance will not process all of that information. It will actually use Kafka to distribute that load. So Kafka is almost used as a queue. So for example, you can use SQS as well. Uh, it doesn't have to be Kafka, uh, but Kafka is a pretty good trusted um, tool essentially, right? To, to deal with this kind of workload. Um, so Kafka will then pass this information to uh, other microservices, which will process that request, process that message, and then send back, or publish other results onto Kafka as well. So then the WebSocket server could also subscribe to those uh, topics, uh, essentially the results topics, and then pass that information back to the player. So everything here is distributed, and that's why we can achieve higher levels of scale. So um, we can potentially look at a different diagram on uh, for this, actually. So let's have a look. OK, so let's take our uh, diagram and uh, let's look at how we can modify it with the new architecture. So what we'll actually do is uh, we'll create these um, WebSocket server instances. Okay, so these are basically uh, parts of our servers 
which have uh, the WebSocket. Uh, we can call it microservice, right? So uh, they just deal with um, the WebSocket communication between the client and the server. What's actually more interesting is the layer that sits on top of it, which is going to be Kafka. And like I say, Kafka will be used pretty much as a queue to process this data. So whenever a client, so whenever your player makes any motion, actually sends the data via the WebSocket to this um, microservice. And then uh, this service over here basically publishes a message to Kafka to say, this client has made some motion. Does someone want to go and process it? So it doesn't even have awareness of, for example, this motion service, uh, which is subscribed to these events. So this motion service is saying, I can do it, so uh, I'll take that message. And you can design it so that even if you scale this out, only one of these uh, services will process that message. So you're not sort of duplicating the effort. Um, it, you, you can design it to process once or for each one of these to receive the message, which we'll actually use shortly. Um, now, as well as Kafka, we'll actually use MongoDB on top as well. So that's where we're going to be persisting that data, which is also uh, quite critical for synchronizing, but uh, we'll cover that a bit later. But ultimately, um, let's let's get back to it. So we have a client, it made some motion, passed it to the uh, WebSocket. The WebSocket created an event to say this player moved. This motion subs uh, motion service subscribed to that event and the, it, it then processed it, uh, did the validations. Um, it creates a job to store it in MongoDB async, so you, you don't need to make it blocking. Uh, and then you actually send back an event uh, with a result. So you can say, uh, okay, I've processed this uh, information, it's valid. Uh, whoever's interested in this client's motion, uh, here's the result for it. So it actually sends that back to Kafka, and then Kafka will send this message to the other subscribers. So these WebSocket um, server instances are actually going to be subscribed to any of the results from uh, the given processes. So uh, in our case, um, it could be that this client is within a range to this one, so it's actually going to be subscribed to uh, the motion from this client. So once it does this full motion, uh, you're actually going to get the result into this one and you're going to relay it back to this client. Now you can design it so that it's um, subscribed to particular events. So th there is like another layer of complexity here because you can have different maps and you don't want everyone to be constantly um, hearing messages from people in different maps. So you can actually um, assign different topics and different filters uh, to avoid that. Uh, but that's kind of the, the gist of it, okay? MongoDB is actually used to synchronize uh, who's within the vicinity. So for example, when uh, this client logs in, you're gonna say, who's near me? And you're gonna ask MongoDB that question. So you're gonna say, who's within my range? And you ask that to MongoDB and uh, the results will be like client one is in your range and then you're going to uh, create a filter to subscribe to that message and uh, this will be covered perhaps in uh, one of the uh, more technical sessions but this is kind of how it's going to work there is one more thing and um, how do we control the mob well the mob is actually going to be um, controlled in a very similar fashion to uh, how the players but this is going to be a UE server. So basically, you'll spin up a UE server, which will just have some AI components to control your monsters. And that's all it's going to have to do. It's basically um, going to be working just as any other player in your game. It's going to be sending commands to move the monster. And uh, it's going to be pushing uh, these updates to a WebSocket. Okay, so is um, actually not too different to how a player would work as well. And obviously it can control more than one mob. So you can have um, a, a whole map controlled by a UE server. If you're starting to hit the scale limitations, you can spawn uh, multiples of these and uh, break that load out. And uh, that will work fine as well. So that that's kind of what we're doing here. And um, it will basically sort of unlock new opportunities for uh, games at scale. But obviously, this is a lot more complicated 
than your vanilla replication. It will take probably years to uh, get something production ready. Um, but it is, uh, you know, I think a step forward in the right direction. So uh, yeah, let's have a look. So um, one of the things that I wanted to um, also cover is why Kafka and why MongoDB. So uh, I basically just opened the web pages from Kafka. So it's an open source distributed event streaming platform used by companies for high performance data pipelines. Um, so analytics, data integration and mission critical applications. So one of the keys here is that it's distributed. So that means whenever you're starting to um, reach scale issues, you can actually uh, add more hardware to it and break that load down. So uh, it becomes very scalable. Uh, which is really great. And that's um, kind of the same thing with MongoDB. So MongoDB is used as a data store. So we're not using um, MySQL or Postgres, which are also great. But the trouble with them is that, you know, they're run on a single node, whereas MongoDB is distributed. So you can see here is a distributed data uh, database at its core. So it's high availability, horizontal scaling. Uh, this is really quite key for our use case. So that's why we're using those um, tools. Yeah, so in the next few videos, we're basically going to look at some of the implementation details. Um, so we'll start with looking at uh, the back end. How, how does the back end actually work? Then we'll look at uh, some of the implementation on the player side in Unreal Engine. Um, I also added a, a very small topic here on how to smooth the actors um, motion. And then we'll look at spawning uh, mobs and synchronizing them using our Unreal Engine server connected to uh, these uh, Java Micronet server instances. So um, yeah, see you next time. Thanks. Bye.